So welcome to What Do They Teach Our Children? Israel's Intervention in American Social Studies Curriculum. My name is Jamil, and I work with author and activist Miko Peled. And I'll be opening up today's discussion, and then I'll pop back in later on and help out with the Q&A portion after the panel's discussion wraps up. So in addition to this Zoom broadcast, we're going to be live streaming this to Miko's Facebook page. So if you want to go ahead and share the event with people who didn't register ahead of time, uh, direct them over to facebook.com slash Miko Peled official, and they can live stream it from there. Um, so this is part two of a webinar series that we organize after having a lot of discussions with people who work in education, policy, and civil rights, and uh, especially conversations with those who've experienced um, what we're going to be talking about firsthand. And what, what we're going to be talking about broadly is intervention and influence that Zionist and pro-Israel interest groups have on this particular institution, education. So in addition to having Miko lead the panel, we are so happy to have a very esteemed guest panel with us today to dive into this topic. These are people who have been involved in local campaigns <laughs> to combat Israel bias in our classrooms. Uh, so these are educators, these are organizers, these are civil rights experts. And with that said, I'd like to introduce them. So we have uh, Jinan Shbat from uh, National Organizer at the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee or ADC. We have Alex McDonald, who uh, is representing the Texas Coalition for Human Rights. And we have Jihan Andani, uh, National Arab American Women's Association, or NAWA. So welcome to the panel, and thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. We hope this discussion will create more awareness on this topic. And I think we could probably all agree that this is a topic that needs more light shined on it um, in the, the broader spectrum of Palestinian justice. Uh, so today's discussion is centered around special interests, pro-Israel groups, and their various interventions into American institutions of education, especially K through 12. We're gonna be focusing, honing in on that. So this is everything from curriculum to textbooks to uh, silencing and censorship within the classroom and basically anything that can stifle a critical discussion of Israel from a historical perspective. And um, it's not just curriculum that's being affected. We've seen a lot of incidents where both students and teachers are censored and bullied for simply recognizing Palestine. Um, so I hope we're all, you know, you all are looking forward to learning about what these fights look like, um, a little bit about what we're up against, which is uh, quite quite a bit. And hopefully, you know, some, some things that we can take home to, uh, you know, educate others about or how we can get involved or, and build from, from here. Acknowledging that they're already has been building in the, in this realm. We're just trying trying to bring it more to light. Um, in terms of housekeeping for the event, uh, we're going to keep this to two hours. So we're going to have the first 60 to 80 minutes dedicated to the panel. Uh, we also want to make room for those Q&As. Uh, so you'll see a little Q&A button if you're on Zoom. And so just at, at any point during the event, if you have a question, hit the Q&A button, put in your question, and then we'll try and get to as many as we can with the time that we have. Um, I also have uh, an event admin with, with us, Michael. He's going to be helping out with the chat room. And if you have any questions, um, you know, uh, for Michael on technical stuff, you can either direct that to, to him or you can uh, put that into the chat. Um, Michael and I will also try to provide links to any of the resources that our guest panelists are referencing throughout the event. Um, and the last thing is we're going to ask that attendees, please keep the chat focused to what is being discussed and relevant. Um, especially to the panelist point, so that it's as educational of an experience as possible. It's totally fine if you have some kind of objection to what is being presented today, but we're not going to tolerate people who just take over the chat and dominate it to broadcast their point of view. So just, just be aware of how much space you're taking up and keep things respectful. It's all we're asking. And that should do it for housekeeping. I'm going to pass it off to Miko to get this discussion started. Thank you, Jamil. And thanks, uh, Michael, behind the scene. And thank you, everybody who's participating um, online. Uh, I understand there might be some people from Palestine. So, hello, sahlan bikum. And thank you to the panelists uh, for uh, taking the time to discuss this. It's, um, you know, last week we did the first part of this uh, discussion. 
and it's incredible how much uh, information there are uh, there is that is not known and how many people who are actually involved in this issue of Palestinian rights and the struggle for Palestinian rights but uh, are not aware of what is happening right beneath our noses right under our noses there's this massive campaign well funded well organized well structured been going on for a very long time to undermine uh, the most basic education uh, that our children, the children are getting. And that's why the, the, the main question that we raised is what are they teaching our children, which is kind of scary, really. Uh, what is happening in public schools? How is it that uh, the pro-Israeli groups are able to infiltrate, uh, to influence, um, and to... Um, interject into things that we take for granted. We assume that what our kids are being taught is what kids should be taught in social science, in, in social studies and history. And yet as we investigate and we look at this issue, we're seeing that at least on this particular topic, uh, they're not really learning the history that they should be learning and they're not given the uh, information to uh, make their own judgment and, the, and, and form their own opinion based on, on what is really taking place. And, you know, particularly today, you know, July 1st, Israel now is supposed, was supposed to announce uh, the annexation of one third of the West Bank, the entire Jordan River Valley. And um, of course they decided not to announce for various reasons, but on the ground, we know that things are already happening. We know that settlers um, in the Southern part of the area, the Southern part of the West Bank, settlers were already moving in, taking over land. The army was there. We know that the people, the Palestinians who do reside in that part of uh, Palestine, in the Jordan River Valley, have been impacted by this already, right now, by this uh, annexation, or Israel, as Israel calls it, the uh, um, uh, announcing its own sovereignty uh, in a unilateral fashion on this on this part of Palestine. So as this is happening and we're struggling with this and we're trying to stop it and we're, you know, we're talking about stopping the, the settler colonialism of Palestine, our kids are learning something completely different in their schools. And I said this last week, I remember looking at my own kids as they were studying at the social, at the, at the social studies uh, textbooks mm -hmm. and just wondering where is all this information, where is the information? I mean, they're not learning what is, they're not really learning the history, they're not really learning as they should be. Uh, this is very, very troubling. And again, we learn about this, the more troubling it is, but the way we need, it's good because that's what it's going to get us to act. And all three of you have been involved in this in one way or another. So I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, your thoughts and, and, and what you've been doing. Um, and so Jihan, we said we'd start with you uh, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about the National Arab American Women's Association and how they've been dealing with this issue of the of the curriculum and the social studies programs. Okay, thank you first of all, Amiko and team for arranging for this panel. It's, 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 I think it's very important to touch on this topic. Uh, my name is Jihan Andoni. I am a Palestinian American that live in Northern Virginia. I'm a board member and a co-founder of the National Arab American Women Association NAWA. Uh, four years ago, a group of us, we felt like there is a lot of misconception about who are Arab American women. And we felt that there is a need for us to establish this group as a platform to voice the, the Arab American woman and who we are and present ourselves. And uh, it was a successful program. And two years ago, we felt that we want to target our work more toward the education because it's a very in, in, important uh, sector. So we established two years ago a group we call it, or a program, Educational Outreach Program. Uh, we as moms, some grandmoms, and students, and educators, we knew that for a long time that students in Virginia are receiving shallow and uh, in, intellectual education about the Middle East. Uh, student, all students, I mean, I'm not talking just about our kids or Arab American kids, do not learn about the different narratives that are needed to, to have a critical thinking and, and skills to, to judge what's going on in the world. 
So as I said, each one coming with stories and that's where we were heading actually to base our bro program. For example, I will share a couple of stories from our members. Uh, we have a member who has a third grade student and uh, during an art uh, actually class, uh, the teacher was sharing art all over the world and she went to Jerusalem and sharing art from Jerusalem and she mentioned Jerusalem in Israel and, and so on. So uh, this student, uh, and she's a shy student, she just came to her uh, friend sitting next to her and said, oh, I'm from Jerusalem and it's Palestine. So the other student came out and said, Miss blah, blah, yeah, uh, my friend is saying she's from Jerusalem, but it's called Palestine. So the teacher reaction was immediately, no, it's, it's in the map, is Israel and Jerusalem in Israel, and she ended up the discussion. So when this member shared the story with us, we gathered about uh, how to get involved and talk about just the, the matter of shying the student for mentioning that is not the best approach. And another story, it was a very interesting and surprising to us, while on one of our workshops, actually, uh, one of the teachers of a second grade teacher, she was asking all, each student to get up and go to the map and show they are from which state and if they are from another country, show in the map where they are coming from. And when she called this student, she went up and started looking, 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 then she started crying. And when she asked why, they said, because I cannot find Palestine on the map. And th that teacher was smart and very considerate and, and she handled it in, in her own way. So uh, as I'm, I'm saying, it's, uh, it's very well known from our um, personal experience. We all have kids or friends or whatever. And we can see that there is actually a bias on teaching the Middle East that is actually shaping the, the perceptions of the, the new generation for critical issues, not just like it's foreign policy, something far away from us. And what, what I keep saying, the first uh, bill in the Senate, as one, it was about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The first House resolution uh, or bill also introduced, it was about the same issue. So when we create a generation that they will carry the wrong perception about the area, we are affecting, we're making effects for many decades to come. So while we are, as I said, a group of us, mom, teachers, students, whatever, trying to shape our program, we heard about the work that um, Virginia Human Rights uh, Coalition is doing about textbook manipulation. So actually we joined the coalition and we are now currently part of the, the coalition. And Jean from the VAHR presented in the last panel a very detailed information about the influence of the Israeli lobby. I'm not sure how much of all of you attended the first panel and I felt it's valuable to go through them through a um, uh, couple of screen because she presented very important information. I would like to share it with you guys. Okay, share screen. Do you see my screen, guys? Not yet, no. Not yet, okay. Something is going wrong. Okay, one second. Even we, thought we tested Michael. <laughs> Did you share screen? I wanna share the screen. Oh, only the host can share. Oh. Only the host can share. Yeah, so, I think last time uh, Jamil made, he needs to make you the host. Uh, Jamil, are you there? Jamil? Yeah, you should be good now. You should be good now. I should be now. So do you see my screen or still I need to share? And yeah. Try sharing once again. <laughs> Sorry for the... Uh, difficulties but we'll do it again okay uh, 
I don't know what's going on. Um, anyway, I can work on sharing it later, with, even though it's very important, but what actually Jean presented at that time is uh, how the chief of the ICS, which is the Institute for Curriculum Services, Elisa Lies, uh, claimed that actually they were managed to, <clears throat> to make over 11,000 changing to the US textbooks. And she also directed how it actually most of the fund coming from the ICS is from the Israeli lobby. And then she mentioned about how in April 2018, a group of state national Israeli advocacy groups, they approached the Virginia for demanding on text changing curriculum and textbook. And some of these examples is actually looks like outrageous. For example, they are uh, requesting deleting any uh, use of the word occupying of the territories and change it to substitute it with control. They are requesting to change the maps of Israel to include the annexation of uh, East Jerusalem and uh, Golden Heights. They don't want to use any word uh, called the uh, settlement and get the, as are the neighborhoods or communities. Uh, they requested deletion of uh, a biography about Hanan Ashrawi from the curriculum and the textbook. So when for us in now actually, we felt these are great job is doing by the VHR and they are uh, actively working on the Virginia level. They are actively working with the publisher of these books to address these issues. But for us in now, we felt the most important thing for us, we felt we can fill the gap on doing the grassroots work. We felt it's very important for us to take this issue and go from uh, county to county, school to school, and, and opening the day and start talking and sharing our concern about the textbooks, curriculum, and more about the whole education system in, uh, in Virginia in specific. And that for us was kind of a pilot. We want to do it in Virginia. So it's very important for me. And now I need to share my screen, Michael. Something is wrong because I want to show something you will like, like it all or you will hate it. Let me have one try. Uh, we were uh, focusing in Fairfax County when one of our members that lives in London County actually uh, told us that uh, she received an email, an email as a mom of a student in Loudoun County that they intended to change the textbooks and mainly the social study books in, in Loudoun County. Uh, so we asked her if you can go, they, they presented in the library, to go to the library and look at, um, I don't know what's going on, why I cannot share. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, sh uh, look at the box and if she, if she find anything alarming, let us know. So when she went to the library, she started texting us, uh, take just photos. I am sharing my screen, guys. Go back. Do you see my screen, guys? No. No. Okay, let me continue the story while I have some technical support here. <laughs> uh, so she sent us one image and I wanted to see you this image, which is uh, an image for one page from the World History uh, HM. It's called the, the Modern Terrorism. And in this page, you will see, do you see it now? No, something is, is going on. Uh, so the first uh, part of the story or the, that picture is showing uh, terrorism around the world. And they start saying that the terrorism actually started by the Palestinian in 1972. And they are referring 
to Munich uh, uh, incident. And uh, they follow it up with more terrorism by Palestinians. Then they jump to talk about terrorism in the Islamic movement and they put everybody in the same bus. So they are talking about Al-Qaeda, uh, Al Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, the Jihad, and the idea of the Jihad. Then the third part of the, the, the picture, they are talking about the Middle East, and you will see Palestinian world all over with Jihad, Hamas, uh, terrorism, <clears throat> and so on. And even the image, do you see my screen now? Yes. <clears throat> okay, here is Jihan, the base I'm, I'm Jihan, talking about. <laughs> Jihan, this is Jamil. I'm, I'm sharing your presentation, okay? So just let me know if you want me to go oh, forward, okay. go back, pause, okay? Okay, sounds good. So the least can be said about this page actually is, uh, is bias and uh, I don't know what other word we can describe it. Anyway, so we uh, get a copy of the book and uh, we have an, a group from NAWA where we study, start studying uh, the books and present some ideas. And if you can, Jamil, go to the second page, please. Jen, this was in a textbook? So this picture was in an actual yes, high school textbook? Yes, yes, it's in page 1297, uh, Miko. Here in Virginia? I mean, in uh, Virginia. In London County, yes. Just like, yeah, yeah. So can you go to the second page, please, Jamil? So we looked at uh, the information and we provided the study saying, this is not the one, the one before it, Jamil. This is the third one. Yeah, this one. No, yes, this one. So we adapted other people who did uh, this kind of uh, research, but we apply it to this book. We were saying, okay, in paragraph uh, this, in this book, we find this paragraph. And we feel this paragraph is, this information is not correct. And we present uh, what we think we should present, uh, how to change it or re rewrite it. And then we <clears throat> uh, give a reason or feedback why uh, we are doing that. So about this incident about the, the Munich or the paragraph, we are simply saying, uh, actually, terrorism started before 1972. It started by, actually, if you want to go to that region, uh, King David incident. And uh, we are talking about how many people died in uh, the 1948 uh, King David uh, incident. And we talked about the, actually, the massacres that happened in 1947 for uh, Dar Yassin and Kufur Qasim, and, and, and it was disaster. And uh, we argue that it's actually coining the Palestinian who are the, doing the terrorists is very uh, inaccurate and, and uh, dangerous. So actually by finding that and writing this material, we were able to manipulate, uh, to mobilize our community in Loudoun County and we start sharing the information and many organizations and groups share the effort. So we wrote letters to the uh, Board of Education. We start uh, meeting with them, go attend to, pre to present our case in front of the Board of Education. And at the end, they dropped the three books that we objected. And I think that was uh, in our side considered a success story when actually a group of people get together to fight something, they listen to it. So I, I will try to finish here. I, I took a lot of time, but what I wanna share with you, uh, two things here, that even that there is state level adopted books, these are not mandatory by the counties and each county has the right to adopt their own kind of books. So the fight is not, happens every five or seven years when the county actually recommending certain count, kind of books because in the county level it's a different story and the second things I want to share with you that we heard this from so many teachers especially in Loudoun County and they they present the idea why we need textbooks because textbooks is not used mainly in the classes and each teacher can uh, depend on certain resources 
to teach their own uh, topic uh, with the resources she picked. And I will end. Uh, I will end it here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jihad. That's an incredible story. That 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 image. Um, do you know how long that 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 image, that book with that image, was in use? How much in image? Uh, let me wait for my second question because I want to share the rest of the story. You will be surprised, Miko. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just say I think that I think it's interesting the whole issue of terrorism and the need to explain terrorism, terrorism. Yeah in order yeah. to support the Zionist agenda, whereas mm -hmm. the real, you know, it's all part of the myth. Uh, you know, I would argue there's really no such thing as Palestinian terrorism. If there is terrorism in the Middle East, in Palestine, then of course it's a Zionist terrorism that began even before, you know, the King David bombing and Diria scene and, you know, even even earlier yeah. with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just like how you pick that date as this is the start day of terrorism. And in one page, you have all these Palestinian words with the flag, the mob, whatever. It, 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 yeah. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hungary. So that's again, that's 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 part of the that's part of the narrative that's being perpetuated, the, the lie that the Palestinians yep. are terrorists and the other side are the, the just innocent bystanders and, and so forth, um, <laughs> which is of course uh, outrageous. Um, okay, well, thank you. Okay, let's go to uh, Jinan. With you've been working, you're doing this uh, work through ADC. So can you tell us a little bit? about what you're doing and what you've seen and your experience and sure um hello everyone thank you miko for hosting this um very happy to be here to discuss this uh especially since palestine now has become such a big issue and um it's a, a lot more um apparent now that people are seeing palestine in a favorable light um, but we're still seeing a lot of um, contention when it comes to schools, uh, specifically, you know, elementary, high school. A, this has been censored, but when you're in, uh, in junior high and high school, we're seeing uh, extremely high rates of uh, punishment and exclusion of students who are showing any pro-Palestinian sentiment or they're trying to uh, correct their teachers when they see something incorrect in textbooks. So I think one of my first earliest memories when I was younger, uh, when I was first demonized for being pro-Palestinian was when I was uh, in seventh grade and we wrote a uh, social studies paper on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. That was our um, that was our assignment and I didn't call it Israel at any point throughout my paper and my teacher found that to be uh, wrong and gave me a failing grade and asked to speak to my parents because of that. Um, I didn't know why it was wrong considering we, you know, we used to go to Palestine all the time and Palestine to me was very much real. Um, but she also reprimanded me in front of my classmates and I think that that's something that we haven't really discussed very much. We talk about what goes into our books, but we don't talk about the things that are in the books that make it to the classroom and how it impacts students. And so bullying of Arab students or pro-Palestinian students uh, is still very high. We've seen cases where there are different organizations like the ADL who come into school to do, ADL is the Anti-Defamation League, and they come in and do anti-bullying trainings. And within those trainings, they will sometimes um, discuss anti-Semitism. They'll kind of sneak it into a slide uh, and, and, and basically show that anything that is anti-Israel is anti-Semitic. Uh, and that obviously creates hostile environments for students. And so we've seen a lot of students who will do projects such as in Georgia last year, um, there was a student who, who was going to a public school who did a project on Palestine and there was outrage and complaints from all of the parents who attended the fair, um, and so the school basically told the student that they would have to resubmit a new project and that they wouldn't accept the one on Palestine. Um, the, the parents of the student who did the project ended up reaching out to a civil rights organization, CARE, um, and there was a, a press conference, a lawsuit, and, and a bunch of different events are, around that. But we're seeing that constantly um, around students who, where they are, basically told um, that if they say anything against uh, what is written in the books or what the teacher is teaching, uh, that it's uh, grounds for discipline. Um, and so one of the things that we like to do at EDC is we, 
we're in the business of being on the ground, uh, working with the communities, educating our communities about their rights, letting them know what they can do in case they see themselves in that kind of a situation. Uh, we've had people have reached out to us from college campuses who have also said because they're pro-Palestine, they have been uh, disciplined um, academically, whether they're put on leave or expelled from certain programs. Um, and so this is not something that is to be taken lightly. It's something that we've seen um, trying to silence the pro-Palestinian narrative in schools. Uh, obviously, we know that the reason why this is happening is because of you know, the favorable uh, views on Palestine. You know, now that we have two congresswomen in office who are Muslim, um, we have very pro-Palestinian sentiment uh, in Congress, specifically recently on the annexation and conditioning of uh, aid to uh, Israel. We, we know that um, something has to be done beyond just the changing of the, the, the textbooks and the information that's being put out into the textbooks. Um, a lot of times we've noticed that there are a lot of correlations and a lot of overlap between evangelical and Zionist uh, narratives that are being pushed in schools. And so we see a lot of organizations who tend to be um, evangelical, very pro-Israel, very Zionist, uh, pushing information into these textbooks. Um, you're also seeing Islamophobia overlap with xenophobia and a lot of students who are being bullied for showing any kind of uh, positive, um, positive uh, affirmations to Palestine are being um, also um, bullied for, you know, being Muslim and being, um, you know, very openly Muslim on, on their school campuses. Um, I hosted a lot of uh, bullying roundtables with students in the Virginia and Maryland area last year. And one thing that we saw consistently was that students speaking up always resulted in them uh, being disciplined. And so the freedom of speech plays into a fact when it comes to civil rights and protection of civil rights for students. Um, and that's something that ADC has always worked on and continues to work on. And so we urge a lot of parents, if they end up getting a lot of these, uh, their students in these situations, to reach out to organizations like us and like CARE in order to be able to let you know what your rights are, right? Because a lot of times, most people, the thing that really tends to hurt us is not knowing exactly what our rights are, what we're able to do and say when we're in these types of situations. You know, when I was a student and I was younger, uh, these organizations were not really around and I wasn't able to really fight what was happening in my classroom. Um, another great thing that ADC has encouraged over the years is the donation of different types of books to the school libraries. Uh, if you're a student and you notice that there aren't very many books on Arab history, on Palestine history, um, everything that tends to be in the library tends to be very Zionist, very pro-Israel, um, you can always ask the schools if you can donate any of the books that you have. We've seen that that actually has been uh, very successful in having changed uh, some of the narrative and giving access to resources to students uh, that they otherwise would not have. Uh, one thing that I was very lucky to have when I was in high school was a teacher who actually didn't want to teach out of the book on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and instead asked me to bring in a speaker of my choosing. So that's always an option as well. And we've seen that also when it comes to teaching world religions and Islam in school, you're able to actually bring in a, a speaker, someone to actually speak on the subject uh, in a way that that's going to be uh, not so one-sided, and that's going to give uh, a little bit more of a balanced, uh, informative uh, presentation on the subject. Um, and so basically, when it comes to ADC, I would say that the biggest thing that we like to keep track of is the preserving of the freedom of speech and civil rights of our students. Um, we're constantly working with our communities. Uh, the, the situation that Jihan mentioned was something that we uh, worked on, we're made aware of. And uh, we continue to make sure that we work with different coalition partners because it doesn't really stop at the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We're now hearing of stories on the history of uh, African Americans, um, you know, uh, slavery, indigenous uh, people, and their and their fights and the the taking of the indigenous lands. Um, so this is something that's much bigger than just what we're working on, but. Um, 
co collectively through coalitions, we're, we're able to get a lot more done. Brilliant, thank you. I think you, uh, just a couple of things you touched on, you know, the, the, this combination of the evangelical and the Zionist narrative, which is a very powerful combination. Basically, they want to teach the biblical narrative. And the biblical narrative, of course, is the biblical narrative. It's not a historical narrative. And it creates the impression, and by the way, this was, you know, I, I went through the Israeli education system and it's the same thing. You learn the biblical narrative as a history. Then there's a gap of 2,000 years and we're back, and the Jews are back. So the, there's this gap of 2,000 years that nothing significant happened at all, not only in Palestine, but in, in the region, you know, in the Middle East. And then you learn about, and I've seen this, I've seen this too when I, when I looked at my, at my kids as they were going through school. You see, you know, you look at the book and you know, they talk about the ancient history. There's like a ton of material talking about the ancient Hebrews and King David and Solomon and all that, and about this much about Babylon and about, you know, ancient Egypt, which are enormous empires where there's plenty of historical material to teach. Um, but that all ties into the narrative, and it all ties into this creating this blank and then coming back and saying, well, now they're back, the Jews are back, Israel is back, and that's really what we want. And that also ties into the Islamophobia, because now suddenly where do these Muslims come from anyway, and why are these Arabs claiming this land, and who are they at all, because they were never there. Well, they were there, and they've been there for those 2,000 years. It's not like there was nothing happening. There was a lot that took place, and that is not being taught and that is a serious gap in the understanding. It's a serious gap historically, culturally, uh, and so forth in the, in, in the children's education. That needs to be taught because important things are taking place um, throughout the region. And even if you, if you isolate Palestine, incredibly important and interesting things historically and culturally were taking place in Palestine, at least for the last 1,500 years that, that, that are very well recorded. And, and many of the monuments are still standing, even though Israel is trying to destroy them. A lot of the stuff is still there. Uh, the least of which, of course, is, a, is Alexa in the mosque and the compound and so forth. Um, you also mentioned uh, the ADL, you know, the Anti-Defamation League. I think it's important to state and to remind everyone, the Anti-Defamation League is a racist or pro-Israel organization that pretends to be a civil rights organization. And it's funny, the name, they call themselves the Anti-Defamation League. They are completely dedicated to the defamation of Arabs and Muslims. So they are not an anti-defamation league at all. They are pro-defamation, but they have their own political uh, racist agenda, which is pro-Israeli, pro, uh, pro of course. And they do try to sneak in. And we talked about this last week, and I've heard lots of stories um, about how they try to, they do all these anti-bullying stuff. They do this, they create this um, anti or racist free or tolerance, uh, you know, whatever uh, spaces, tolerant spaces. But in these curriculum, in the curriculum, in their teaching, they always put in equating Palestinians with terrorism. And there's always some little thing that hints, if not blatantly talks about how opposing or rejecting Israel is uh, anti-Semitic. Anti um, okay, so Alex, you wanna tell us a, bit, a little bit about what's been happening in Texas? Sure. Um, so thanks Miko for having me and uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the Texas Coalition for Human Rights uh, was formed uh, the end of 2018 uh, when uh, I heard, I saw in the, in the news that the uh, State Board of Education was going over uh, its standards, re, uh, updating its standards for world history. And one of the examples was uh, how it was treating the Israel-Palestine situation. And so we reached out and got uh, a little over a dozen uh, different uh, organizations to uh, to be uh, members, and uh, with uh, the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights as a guide and a great mentor. Uh, so thanks very much to them. We were able to get up to speed quickly and um, and do testimonies, and were able to change some of the standards. And I'd like to show you some of those today um, to give you an idea of the severity of of. I'll give you some actual examples of what where the situation is. Um, although uh, being from Texas, we always think that Texas is the most important state. Um, in education, it's actually the case. And, and the reason is Texas uh, has one-tenth of the students in this country. 
and it's the prime it's it's the largest state that has the educational uh, curriculum and standards that are uh, controlled by the state as opposed to by the school district. And so because of that influence, um, we uh, the textbook companies are very, very focused on on getting the Texas standards to be used for textbook manufacturing and printing, and therefore other states also use the Texas standards. Uh, world history is taught in 10th grade. And um, to give you an idea, there are 400,000 uh, 10th graders in Texas in the public school system alone. So it's a significant population. And so it has a very, very big impact. Um, in uh, the, the standards are what Texas calls TEKS, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. And the, the first question, Miko, that you asked was, um, what evidence do we have that uh, there are other interests changing the curriculum? Um, uh, when, when we did our oral testimony in front of uh, the State Board of Education, uh, there were uh, three other speakers who, uh, who were actually there lobbying for changes. And um, they represented a, an organization called uh, Truth in Textbooks, um, which uh, is an interesting name. Once you see some of the, I'll give you an example of some of their recommendations. And uh, Jewish Federation and um, uh, B'nai B'rith, so Zionist organizations. Um, so let me just try to share my screen and, um, and give you an example of some of these, uh, what, what we're actually dealing with. Do you all see my screen? Yeah. Oh my God. So uh, this is our site. But um, to give you an idea, what was originally propo proposed was this was the extent of the Texas standards on covering the Israel-Palestine situation. Can you all see that? Okay. It basically it says a student is expected to explain how Arab rejection of the state of Israel has led to ongoing conflict. But first of all. We were able to show in front of the State Board of Education that this was against even uh, TEKS standards because it did not um, it did not encourage a student to understand multiple perspectives. It did not encourage research. Uh, it basically just gave people the answers. Um, the The board, by the way, is fifteen has fifteen members. Uh, Ten of them are Republican, five are Democrat, and uh, the, the Republicans tend to be much more, as Miko, you were talking about, uh, Christian Zionist in leaning. And so there's a very, very strong uh, emphasis on that. So we were able to get it changed um, to not, so we, we pointed out that this was uh, both racist because it was not just Arab nation, but Arab people. Um, and that it was a totally one-sided and dis, and um, discouraged investigation and discussion. And so uh, we were able to get um, that added. So that was a big plus. One thing that, that you've also mentioned that I think is important is the association with terrorism and so on. There's obviously a conflation of uh, Islamic terrorism with the Israel Pal with Palestinians and, um, and, and on the other side, Israel being like us in America, you know, the democracy and things of that nature. And so that's a really important theme because in some ways it's done very subtly and in some ways it's done uh, much more uh, brazenly. Uh, we were also able to change a couple uh, of uh, issues related to Islam, um, you know, which was basically a lot about Islamic fundamentalism, and we were able to add that uh, we were able to add the fact that there were some uh, geopolitical influences that helped create that, which was not there before. Um, I'd like to show you to give you an idea of what some of the um, what we're seeing in terms of uh, I, I mentioned the uh, truth in textbooks and. Um, Jihan mentioned how uh, Institute for Curriculum Services had done a lot of textbook reviews. Uh, this is a copy of uh, 
of the Truth in Textbooks review of, of the textbook and their correspondence with the textbook publisher. And I just think it's kind of interesting. Um, so for example, here are their notes. They found that the publisher, uh, you know, what, what they had done was unacceptable because the reestablishment of the Jewish Hamlin was not an was not an act of aggression designed to take land by force or to capture and subdue people. Students need to learn that Zionism is a national movement for the return of the Jewish people to their historic homeland and the resumption of Jewish sovereignty to the land of Israel, where they have maintained a continuous presence since biblical times. So these are the kind of influences uh, that this organization has or is is uh, promoting with um, um, with, with the, the, the textbook manufacturers. You mentioned terrorism. Here is here's, uh, their feedback. Nowhere in this paragraph does, does the publisher identify the terrorists as Muslims or Islamic jihadists. So it's very, very uh, aggressive in that sense. Just to give you an idea of, of the strength or the impact of Texas, I mean, uh, uh, truth in textbooks, uh, they, boast that they had over uh, 200 volunteers who uh, were part of a three-month training program and, um, and were providing all kinds of uh, feedback to textbooks, not just on this subject, but uh, a broad range of subjects. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite extensive. Um, we've talked about um, the Institute for Curriculum Services. Uh, let me, when we look at, uh, or let me show you first um, what El Paso. So, th so these, these, uh, this is, believe it or not, we think this is bad. This is actually an improvement. This was what the the State Board of Educa Education was going to do as an improvement. Let me show you what it actually is today. This is from El Paso School District, and this is the previous ones. Um, you, you recognize this, but then notice what it, about definition of um, terrorism. The next bullet summarize the development and impact of radical Islamic fundamentalism on events in the second half of the 20th century, including Palestinian terrorism and the growth of Al Qaeda. This, this is, is the Texas, Texas standard right. as it was adopted in the in the school year 2011 to 2012, it's the standard that was adopted for the textbooks and they are still in, in use today. Uh, this is so in use today still? Alex, this is still it, in use today. It's still in use today because the change that we got in November of 2018 was part of what they call a streamlining process, which means you're reducing content, you're not adding, and so, so they're supposed to be teaching the new standard, but, but there are no requirements for new textbooks. And so you can still teach out of the old textbooks, um, but the standards have changed. So they probably should have changed this because this is the old standard. This is no longer in the new standard, but they clearly haven't gone to that trouble. And so one of the things that we're doing uh, and that we're, we're needing some help with, and so anybody, I'm taking volunteers, um, is to this go. Tenth grade. This is tenth grade world history. Yes, this is tenth grade. You see, ten. That's what this ten is right here. It's tenth right. grade world history. And uh, so, so anyway, so this this gives you an idea of the kind of environment that we have. Um, Got to interject something here, Alex. Just I don't want to, you know, inter interrupt your yeah. your thing, but. This is just takes me back. You know, the, uh, I wrote a book about the Holy Land Foundation Five, and in the trial, in the second trial, which was a trial in which they were convicted, this is exactly what was bought by the prosecution. The state came in, and the prosecutors had a, an expert who made that link between this Palestinian terrorism and Al Qaeda and 9/11, and that was. Should have been, you know, it was the, the the obviously the defense team objected, but the, the the judge allowed this this testimony, and this is how they got them convicted by by creating this false narrative, this false history, 
these connections that do not exist, vilifying Palestinians, vilifying Muslims, and that's how these got at least the Holy Land Foundation Five convicted is by perpetuating this. So to see this is actually in, you know how long this has been in the textbook? Well, this was this was approved in uh, 2010, in the, in the end of 2010, and was implemented with the school year 2011-2012. Okay, so this has been around for almost a decade. Almost. So there's no, no surprise that the, and, this is this is how people this is how people view this. I mean, and this, this is, is 400,000 tenth graders in public school alone in Texas alone. So it's just much more much more significant than that every year. So it's significant. Um, you you mentioned in the last uh, uh, webinar that you did last week, of course the the the, the six day war with uh, with your father's involvement and how sometimes they're not mentioned. If you scroll down and look at actually this lesson plan, they go they go into the background of the conflict. They mention they mention the Yom Kippur War, um, but they don't mention. Uh, they don't mention the 67 war until um, until the way bottom. So it's, again, it's very selective in how it's approached and so on. What was that Arab insurgents? Can you, can you bring that back up? Sure. Tell me stop. Right, oh, yeah, right here? Yeah. Yeah, this right here, yeah. But Arab even, insurgents, the, even the word yeah. Arab insurgents during so not anyway, Palestinian, not Palestinian freedom fighters. No, um, and 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 so um, you know, the the question that you asked was the curriculum, and I'd like to sort of broaden the definition of, of curriculum because you can say curriculum is only the what's in the book, but it's also the whole uh, student experience. And so one of the important parts of the student experience is what the teachers learn, and as was mentioned last week by Jean. Uh, uh, Institute for Curriculum Services has a very robust program for teaching teachers. Um, I went to the, I, I, I picked up one of their 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 handouts. It's a it's a map, uh, and I want to just read you uh, what it says on the on the front. At the Institute for Curriculum Services, we believe that students who are better informed become better citizens in our pluralistic society. When it comes to Jews, Judaism, and Israel, however, the information the K through 12 students receive is often misleading or incorrect. Okay, so that's the background. But inside they have all these maps. None of them, of course, show any settlements, all right? None of them show, it, you know, any kind, anything of that nature. And I love some of the, uh, the, 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 um, the legends. So right here, this map is regional boundaries after the uh, 1948 war. And the legend down here, you see how it's got Egypt and then Jordan. And, and right. it, 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 the legend reads, land gained by Jordan, land gained by Egypt, and, and then uh, the armistice, you know. So it's interesting that how they, uh, they, 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 they were gained as opposed to, uh, and, and then here on Israel, it's land gained. It never mentions that land was gained by force for Israel and was not for Jordan and, um, and Egypt. So, you know, those kinds of distinctions are, are really left out. Anyway, I just wanted to sort of give you an idea of some of their materials. And, and, and I think I've taken too much time, so, uh, but I wanted to just give you some of the examples. So I hope that's helpful. No, you haven't taken too much time. And guys, there's no such thing as too much time. The information you have is incredibly valuable. So don't try to, you, you don't need to worry about time. Just say what you've got. This is, this is stuff that most, I know I, I, I'm new to this and I've been dealing with Palestine for a long time. And I'm sure the participants are signed in and on Facebook and everywhere to hear exactly what you guys have to say. So don't, don't apologize. Um, but I'm, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's Christian, there's, there's no such thing as Christian terrorism being taught is there or Jewish terrorism, but somehow there's Islamic terrorism. Although as we look particularly at Palestine and the Middle East, if we want to expand it beyond Palestine, 
the majority of what we see is violence perpetuated by Jews and Christians. You know, and so if if you were to want to characterize terrorism and give it a religion or impose a religion on it, those would be the first to come. Whereas the whole idea of Islamic terrorism, Palestinian terrorism is of course part of the Zionist myth. It's not really something that that is uh, that exists beyond that mythology. Um, and I think that's, I, I don't see how is how it is that educators can look at this. People who are not informed about Palestine, Palestine, who don't care about the Middle East or about any of this, but they look at this, they say, how do they not say, what is this nonsense? What do you mean Islamic terrorism? This is absurd. There could be a um, uh, terrorist group here, or maybe there's a terrorist group there, but is it really a terrorist group and, and so forth? And when you look at Palestinians, and if you understand the history of the last hundred years in Palestine, how could you possibly, a, how could you possibly characterize what Palestinians are doing as terrorism? It's complete nonsense. There is no such thing as terrorism other than what the Palestinians have been suffering themselves, uh, receiving uh, themselves. So I don't understand how these educators look at this and are not appalled by what we see and, and is obviously appalling to us and, and everybody or many of the people that are, that are commenting and, and listening to this. So let's talk about the tactics um, and maybe we'll go back to you, Jihan, and what, what, you said you had some stuff you're going to tell us, continue what you, were, what you said earlier. So go ahead. Okay, yes, uh, and it seems now I can share. So let me share my screen because I think people didn't see um, the page I was referring to. So, uh, so I will give you time while I'm moving to the second topic. So I feel the most important technique that have been used is the multidimensional influence, I will call it. And it happens like I shared with you this story and how we defeated the adoption of this box and hasn't been adopted by London County and we consider that a success. It happens by accident. I was talking to a daughter of one of my friends that she's a student in London County a um, few months ago and she mentioned to me that actually in one of the SOL tests, there was three questions about uh, the Middle East. And one of them was, what is the capital of Israel? Which of course they have to pick uh, Jerusalem to, be, to, to get the grade and the right question. And she shared with me that I, I was shocked and surprised because we dropped this book and uh, when I was talking with the, the, the board of education there that those, those material doesn't get introduced in the, in, in, in the class. So while I'm talking with her, she mm -hmm. mentioned that his, her teacher is using a, a website uh, for another teacher in uh, London County. It seems this teacher is very influential teacher. He took the time or somebody helped him to, uh, to build a website with all the history curriculum. Uh, looking into his... Uh, actually curriculum and uh, the information in the website. And you can see it's the, the Freeman uh, Media website. And if, lo if you look at the topics, uh, what the students should learn in this class, it's almost the same as the book that we thought that we defeated. Can you see my screen, guys? Yes. Okay. So it's the same thing, the Munich, the terrorism, the carjack, the suicide bombing, and, and so on. To tell you the truth, I was surprised. And I went to search on the website of Department of Education of Virginia to find actually in the, under the SOL for the ninth grade, those are the, what the kids should learn to be able to pass the SOL for this section. And if you can see, it's one-to-one -one match between that book, this uh, website by, done by a teacher, and the framework of the SOL in the Department of Education of London County. So uh, fighting textbook is important, but if we just focus on textbooks, we're not going to reach anywhere. We have to understand the depth and the multitude where they are playing in. 
And to add to this equation, uh, I will share with you an incident. It just came to our uh, attention. Just few, uh, so I will stop sharing now. This is all the slides I want to share. Uh, the, a few, uh, three, four weeks ago, one of our members, uh, she received an email from the teacher of her um, daughter, which is, she's in third grade. And they are asking her to go and watch uh, something called virtual uh, field trips. And when she looked at the website, they have around 50 uh, videos, two of them uh, about Jerusalem. And when you look at the, the and you, when you watch these, which you cannot watch it all because um, we don't have subscription, but we watched enough from it to see that they are totally biased, these books. Um, they are talking about how uh, Jerusalem is in Israel. They don't mention the word Palestinian at all. There is one mention of Arabs. When they talk about East Jerusalem, of course, you see the donkey and an old man on the, on, on, on the video. And they are focusing wholly on the, the religious part of it. The majority was about Judaism and a little bit about Christianity and uh, Islam. And as everything is Kumbaya and everybody, it's a holy land for everybody. And I cannot but inject my personal story and my personal feeling when it comes to this point, because I'm a Christian Palestinian. I was a teacher in East Jerusalem. I go and uh, I, I used to go every day there and walk in the street of all Jerusalem. It has a special space in my heart. And I am American citizen and I have been visiting Palestine every year and taking my kids there. And for over 25 years, I wasn't able to go and visit Jerusalem and take my kids to, the, the, to, to, to see the Jerusalem and visit the place that's very close to my heart, where one of my kids, I gave birth to him in Jerusalem. And of course, no mention like any Palestinians, Christians or Muslims, if they wanna go to, the, or, or, um, to Jerusalem, they have to take a special permission and under the luck, they may accept it or not for a week, for one day or for a month and so on. So sorry for injecting my personal feeling and story here, but I was get I was so upset when I saw this video and how they presented Jerusalem, the holy place, it's for all religious and so on. And there is no mention of the Palestinian and the original people. So the message I wanna say here is we need to focus definitely beyond textbooks. And because many teachers think they don't use these books, but there is resources like this Freeman free uh, Bidia, it's used. They, they talk the time and, and he is accepting donation uh, and contribution to build his website. And they are influential and accepted where people are using it. There is a hidden thing in the SOL uh, framework that they are expecting the teachers to teach those so the kids can pass the SOL. There is the video, I, I, I'm mentioning it. So to fight a multidimensional influence, I think to have also a multidimensional effort in this aspect. The second item I, I wanna talk about, and we witnessed it firsthand actually, guys, when Samia was talking um, last time about the intimidation. Uh, it's not strange, like in the last couple of years, we all, so the multitude of new bills, whether it's in the Senate or the House or in the state level, where they are trying um, um, to, to conflict or to, to make it clear that um, actually the, the anti-Semitism um, criticizing of the human rights of the Palestinian in Israel are the same. All we know in our life that actually anti-Semitism is the irrational uh, hatred of the Israeli, of the Jew people. But it comes to any advocacy of the Palestinian cause or any of those as to be anti-Semitic, this is very dangerous and serious. 
So even though a teacher who, as you said, Mike, they see the fact and they listen to the news and it's open, they are going to be very hesitant to present the two points of, uh, of the issue. So either they will pass through it, they educate it in a very shallow uh, uh, mat matter, or when they touch it, they just present one point of view. So between the multidimensional and uh, intimidation, I think they have been very successful. And I will mention one last time here technique, I, I want to mention it, which is what they call it a peer-to-peer -peer program or student-to-student -student program. It happens to hear about it that we have been invited to attend a, a, a workshop in London County where there were several groups present to that, the head of the teacher of the social study department. And when it comes to one of the groups or Jewish group, they were talking about in London County by itself, they have over a hundred uh, individual students who are part of this program where they can, it's, I think it's from the JCRC uh, group. Uh, over 100 students that they go and teach the teacher and teach the, stu uh, the student about Judaism and so on. Uh, we are fully supportive of uh, humanitizing Ju uh, Judaism. It's nothing wrong about it, but it shouldn't be uh, exclusive and you exclude other minorities uh, from having access to this program. Since that day, we have been at least an hour trying contacting Board of Education, talking to so many boards on how you can build this peer-to-peer -peer program. And so far, we didn't reach uh, this success. Uh, hopefully, in, in, in the future, I can uh, uh, share good news with you about it because this is very influential for both sides. It's influential because our kids get to know their part of the story and they can share it with their teacher and their student more than uh, anybody else. So uh, there are so many kind of techniques they are using, but I will stop here. Thank you. Um, and again, what you said about uh, Jerusalem is so telling, because if we, again, if we did talk about Jerusalem historically, uh -huh. And, um, you know, the western part of Jerusalem was occupied and subjected to an ethnic cleansing campaign that was complete. In other words, not a single, after 1948, there was not a single Palestinian allowed to remain in West Jerusalem. Not one. Mm -hmm. The homes remain, the beautiful home, the neighborhoods are still there, uh, but, there, but not a single Palestinian was allowed to remain in West Jerusalem, and that became the capital city of Israel. And if you asked anybody, what is the capital city of Israel? They said Jerusalem and vice versa, you know, and Palestine never comes up. And then, of course, in 1967, they occupied the second, the half, the other half, the eastern part of Jerusalem. And now they're doing the same thing in the eastern part of Jerusalem, destroying monuments, renaming streets, renaming neighborhoods, even in the old city, uh, to a point where they're gradually erasing the Arab history of Jerusalem and bringing it trying to make this connection to this mytho mythology that supposedly took place some 3,000 years ago. Uh, this is precisely the problem that we're, that we're talking about. And Jerusalem is so, is, is unique, number one, is unique. And it's also, um, it's also like a microcosm in a way of what is happening all over Palestine. Um, and Jerusalem is the name that everybody recognizes. So to associate it immediately with Israel is, uh, is so tragic because the last 1500 years, the last 1500 years in Jerusalem have been marked by Arab presence and mm -hmm. Muslim presence and so forth. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, Jinan, go ahead. We're talking about what tactics do we know that they're using? So go ahead, please. Are we talking about this, the schools or what, I mean, um... I'm not yeah, understanding what, yeah. what tactics do we, what tactics do, we do we know that they're, that they're using in the schools, yeah. 
Um, well, I mean, a lot of it is what Jihan mentioned and, and Alex mentioned. So we, we obviously know, like I said, that the, um, the influence, um, and, and here's the thing that I, I wanted to say before that I think is extremely important is a lot of times when these books are up for being, um, rewritten or um, uh, have had, you know, things added or detracted from them, they do put a call out to the community. And a lot of times they'll put calls out to parents and um, a lot of the uh, community members to come and actually look at that. And at ADC more recently, we've been encouraging our community members that when those calls are coming out to actually go in and sit there and review these books. Uh, it does take some time, obviously, because you're talking about like really thick textbooks, but at the same time, if we're not checking these things, then a lot of the stuff that Alex and Jihan showed us are being included in this book without us actually seeing it. And the only time we realize it is when the children are now in school and they're seeing it and they're trying to speak up in school and being silenced and they come home and say, mom and dad, this is what they're saying about Arabs or Muslims or Palestinians in school. So um, it's really important to use that as a resource because I was reading through the, the, the chat box and someone was asking like, what, does, what can the community do? So that's like a very active, very proactive thing that uh, community members can do. Uh, another thing um, is, uh, you know, just like they try to bring in speakers from different organizations, like I said before, like the ADL or if they bring in rabbis from the local community, see about bringing in your own speakers. And a lot of times it's really good to approach it in a more um, a more balanced way. Obviously, you want to you want to bring somebody who's going to speak about the Palestinian struggle and, and someone that's going to come in and speak on the other side. But we know that sometimes that can be refused. And a lot of people in the chat box were saying that they're very schools are very strict about who they're bringing in. But we worked a lot with the schools in Maryland and Virginia, and we were able to actually go in and, and you know, put together presentations and actually speak to hundreds of social secure or uh, social studies teachers uh, about what's being put in the books and offer uh, alternative resources and websites that they can use to teach these specific subjects. Um, so that's another uh, way that you can actually approach this. Um, and then also, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of different books that are out there that can be added to the library. Um, it doesn't always have to be nonfiction books. There are a lot of really great fiction books written by Arab writers uh, on Palestine that teach the history while also telling a story. Um, there's A Curious Land by uh, Suzanne Daraj, and there's also uh, Mornings in Janine by Suzanne Abul Hawa. Those are two really, really great books, and I, I personally learned a lot from them. And to Jihan's point, a lot of times when the, the teachers are talking about the Palestine-Israeli issue, they're framing it as Jewish versus Muslim. And the reason why they're doing that is obviously they're not trying to frame it as a human rights or civil rights issue. Uh, they want to frame it as a religious issue because a lot of people don't want to get involved if it's a religious issue. But we know that it's erasing a lot of Christian Palestinians from the narrative when they're framing it that way. So it's really important that you're bringing in a lot of these speakers and books that are going to show that Palestine is not a religious issue between Palestinians and, and, and Jews. It's mostly, uh, you know, we're talking about human rights of an occupied people. Uh, and, and Christian Palestinians obviously have had, you know, uh, you know, so much more, you know, influence and have a lot at stake living uh, in the occupied territories just as much as the Muslims. Um, we know the most famous Palestinian, Jesus, right? So uh, mm -hmm. it's very important, <laughs> very yes, important that we're, <laughs> yeah, it's very important that we are like bringing that up in the conversation a lot because we've seen it lately when we've been talking a lot about the annexation. It is, I know, I took that from him. He's going to say, I think, stole that thing. <laughs> has a trademark on that. <laughs> it's okay, we're friends. He lets me borrow it sometimes. Oh, um, but, but, you know, it's, it's true though, because a lot of people tend to forget that, uh, Palestine is also a, a Christian issue. And so, uh, again, going back to the, the evangelical influence and, and, you know, the, the erasing of Christian Palestinians, uh, there's, there's a very real, um, uh, a very targeted campaign against erasing that specific voice because, coming in as evangelical Christians saying, you know, this is what we believe. It's erasing the Christian Palestinian voice uh, and creating um, kind of like a, you know, 
a, a gloss over everything so that people don't realize that um, there are more people who are, are suffering under the occupation and, and should have uh, recognition when talking about this issue. Um, and so uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. You know, the, um, um, Mr. Niao just gave a talk. I, Kufi, you know, Christian United for Israel just had their conference, mm -hmm. and obviously, you know, virtual conference, and it's Niao who gave a speech. And one of the points he made, he was, uh, he was talking about the annexation, but of course he talked about Israeli, Israel finally having its, you know, sovereignty over all these holy places that have biblical stories and, the, you know, or the, where this happened and that happened, it's all very biblical. And then he said, you know, this is our history as Jews, but of course it's also your history. This is also your identity as Christians. And to, together, you know, we are going to protect it for all of us. And in an area where Christians are fleeing and area Christians are running away, blah, 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 we're protecting Christians. And, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware, but a great resource uh, to learn about the reality of Christians in Palestine it was a 60 Minutes program that was hosted by the late Bob Simon. And anybody who hasn't seen that, hasn't seen, will never understand this reality, this, this big lie that somehow Israel protects the Christians and cares about the Christians or cares about anybody in Palestine that's Palestinian is such a big lie. And in that, in that 60 Minute um, episode, this program that Bob Simon hosted, first of all, he does a brilliant job because he was a brilliant um, journalist, but he demonstrates clearly that what Palestinians suffer, Palestinians suffer. It's got nothing to do if they're Muslims or Christians, number one. And in the end, he has this confrontation with the, with the former Israeli ambassador in Washington, D.C., and it's something that everybody has to watch. So in terms of resource, and again, you know, if we're talking about providing teachers with resources, there's a great resource. If they want to talk about Christianity in Palestine and, and the history of Christians in Palestine, you know, number one, there's a lot of resources, and I agree, uh, with Jinan, there's a lot of great fiction that people can read about Palestine, that, that, I mean, students can read about Palestine and tell the history, and I, I, the two references you gave, I agree, are excellent, um, but, you know, something like this, like this Bob Simon documentary is, is wonderful, and it's, um, and the Israeli ambassador, of course, hated it, and the Israelis hated it, because it, not, it doesn't, it doesn't, again, it doesn't uh, follow the, the line, it doesn't follow the narrative that they that they want to uh, present. <clears throat> um, Alex, uh, uh, Alex, why don't you go ahead? All right, great. So um, when I think of uh, the tactics used, uh, I think of it as a three-legged stool. Um, first of all, it's they have to continue to, um, you know, push the uh, the narrative and the mythology. Number two, they have to withhold the facts that are important that uh, blows away the mythology. And third, they need to have an intimidation set of techniques to prevent people from, uh, from you know, um, contesting the mythology and by providing those other method, uh, those other facts. And so I, I sort of look at it through those lens and I think it's, it's helpful to do that. And so not only do we have the, the standards like uh, I showed earlier, um, but we've had, as was previously discussed both today and, and last week, uh, the intimidation of teachers. Uh, there were a couple examples given last week. Uh, there's another one uh, that uh, I know of in uh, May of 2017, a uh, Quaker Friends Central School in Philadelphia fired two teachers after they invited a Quaker professor from Swarthmore to come and speak um, on uh, Palestine. And that was after, even though it's a Quaker school, a lot of the, um, the, the students are Jewish because it's a great school and a lot of the Jewish community in that area uh, prized this school. And uh, they, um, and so anyway, it's, uh, it turned into a, a real mess. And um, anyway, so that's just an example also of the intimidation that goes on. Um, interestingly enough, this is not on the high school level, but on the college level. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about anti-BDS um, that was also mentioned last week. But uh, two of the cases that are not as well known, there were five cases in, in Texas uh, that, that uh, uh, took the state to court for the anti-BDS law. Um, and two of them were students who were, uh, who were debate 
judges for debating tournament, uh, intercollegiate uh, debating tournament. And to be judges and get paid for judging, they had to sign um, a, uh, a pledge not to, to boycott Israel. Uh, and students so, have to, the students have to take the pledge? Yes, because it's a, it, it's a state law that if you're gonna do business with the state of Texas, you have to, you're a contractor. And so as contractors, by being judges in a debating contest for between state schools. This is crazy. They sign it? Did they sign it? I don't know if they signed it, but, but they won the court case. Oh, of course. So, um, but anyway, they were two out of the five. And of course, uh, Bahia Amawi is the famous, is probably the most famous of them, <laughs> uh, who was a, a, a Pflugerville um, speech um, pathologist or, or a teacher. And uh, she did a phenomenal job. And um, anyway, uh, so I just want to show how it affects students, the anti-BDS. And that's part of this, the third leg of the stool to, to really uh, discourage speaking up. Um, so uh, one thing that I think is uh, part of this promoting the mythology, and I, I mentioned earlier this uh, conflation of Israel being the civilized Western country of our American values and the Palestinians being the uh, Islamic terrorists and so on is this sort of sympathy or empathy with, uh, with Israel. And so there's a very systematic uh, approach. Uh, we've talked about ICS a number of times in this conference. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, within um, I think it was six years of the founding of ICS, uh, one of their members was the president of the National Council for, so for the Social Studies. So they're very active in the whole teacher education aspect and the whole politics of, of um, you know, visibility in the teacher organizations. So that's part of their tactics. Um, the whole message of anti-Semitism, you know, the part of this, the, the whole school experience includes um, also the, the not in the classroom, but the projects the field trips and so on. And so this whole emphasis on anti-Semitism is very strongly tied with Israel. Uh, and they're always, they're connected. And so I'll show you my screen. We've talked about the ADL and their program, the No Place for Hate. Um, I'll show you a, what one of their brochures looks like. You all see my screen? Oh God. So this is, and, and you know, they're very slick. Uh, imagine a world without hate, uh, everything politically correct, uh, and so on. Um, but if you go down to their definitions, um, it's, you know, here in the, and just so you know, this goes out to elementary, middle, and high schools. And so, you know, if, if I were to ask you for a definition of racism or uh, anti-Semitism, I think we could come up with a definition that elementary school kids could understand. But uh, look at this definition here of anti-Semitism. First of all, it includes the Jewish state of Israel. Notice it's not just the state of Israel, it's the Jewish state of Israel. Um, and, and it's an extremely complicated definition. So imagine you're a sixth grader trying to understand what this means, what are you gonna get out of it? Uh, you know, basically uh, that, you know, it's a Jewish state and you don't criticize Israel if you don't wanna be anti-Semitic. If you go down to definition of racism, again, a very complicated definition, but, and it emphasizes skin color, hair texture, eye shape. Now, you know, would it be considered racist to discriminate against Palestinians using this definition. You know, I don't think a sixth grader could know that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's these really sort of slick approaches uh, to really creating these barriers to, and this sort of a, a moat around the possibility for criticism. Um, and one can't talk about uh, anti-Semitism without mentioning, of course, the Holocaust. It's sort of the elephant in the middle of the room. And so there's a lot of education that goes on about that. Um, 
just to give you an idea on the, that the part of the curriculum that I showed you earlier about the, the Middle East conflict, it's, it's one day maybe of, of class time, uh, in, including those, those, those components. But for example, in Texas, we have a whole week of Holocaust remembrance. And so this, and just so you understand, this is a government, um, this is the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. And it has programs for students, including Holocaust Remembrance Week. And I'm just highlighting this because of course, educators are strongly encouraged to teach as much about the Holocaust as possible. Um, uh, and, and so they have, they have contests for writing the best, um, uh, essay or, or, or art um, project I think nothing, to the Holocaust. Nothing there, Alex, there's nothing there about the genocide of the Native Americans or uh, no. massacres of, of, of uh, Tejanos or anything like that in Texas or slavery or anything like that. I, I know of no such commission. There may be, but I'm not aware of it. I don't think there's, no, there, there is a uh, Black the, History Month. There is Black History Month. They have overviews of Holocaust and genocides and they've got Holocaust and the genocide in Cambodia, genocide in Rwanda. They've got all these things on the list there on the left, on the bottom. Right here, here they talk about uh, of the whole uh, of other ones as well. But but it, it tends to be focused on the Holocaust itself. Yeah. And 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 the reason you know we everybody should know about the Holocaust. Uh, there's no denying, and 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 that's an important part of history. But what's interesting is is it's it's put so much focus. That the um, uh, Pew did a, a, a survey, and 45% of Americans know that uh, we're able to say that six million Jews died in the Holocaust, but only 23% could name the three branches of our government. And so that just tells you the amount of emphasis that's put on here. And the reason I bring up the Holocaust is is because um, there are a, um, if you go to any Holocaust museum, and there are over 20 Holocaust museums and, and, and memorials or monuments in the United States. Um, and to give you an idea, the, the, the US national one is on the mall in Washington and was opened over a decade before the American Indian one and over two decades before the African American one on the national mall. And so that just tells you sort of priorities where things are. And, and the reason it's important is, is, let me show you a picture of the St. Louis. Uh, can you see the picture here? Yeah. This is the, the narrative of, and I've been to a, a quite, a, quite a few of the, of, um, the, um, the, 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 the museums and such, including by the way, at the Texas State Museum, they had a traveling Holocaust Memorial exhibit. But the, the narrative always goes through, of course, the atrocities and the anti-Semitism and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the segregation and then the, the gas chambers and so on. But it always ends up on Israel. That's sort of the relief of these. And this is the birth of Israel is the stop here at the end of of them and and you know this is uh, uh, this is what kids see um, of the National Museum uh, ten million uh, 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 school children have been through that museum a quarter of the visitors are school children and so part of the school experience is going to many of these museums and seeing that Israel is the saving grace. And it's kind of interesting, nobody ever brings this up, but, or the logic that the solution to an ethnocentric racist state is another ethnocentric racist state, right? Nobody ever brings that up in class and anywhere, but that's the narrative that's able to be promoted uh, through these. And so I just, you know, it's, it's, it's an important part of, 
the experience of, of the education of, uh, of students. And I think that's really important. Um, I think that's all I've got uh, for, for, for now. Thank you for this question. You know, and again, if we're going to talk about the history and, and include the Holocaust, um, like you said, first of all, the, 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 the assumption that somehow creating a racist state somewhere else for the people who were victims of, 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 um, of genocide as a solution is, is really absurd, number one. And number two, the vast majority of survivors of the Holocaust did not go to Palestine to what became Israel. The vast majority of Holocaust survivors either stayed in Europe or came to America. So historically, it's not true that somehow Israel is the end of the story of the Holocaust, because the vast majority of the Holocaust survivors themselves did not go. In other words, that is quite a statement, I think, the fact that they didn't well, go to the, what became Israel. The, the part that's interesting to me from, and the reason I'm, I talk about those three-legged stool, and the reason this is, is, is so interesting to me is, imagine if, you know, France or Spain or Germany or UK had 20 museums about African-American slavery in the United States. Yeah. Or of the American genocide of Native Americans. I mean, it's, you know, we've got plenty of genocide for our, that we had blood on our hands, you know, it's very interesting that that uh, that this has become so prominent, and 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 I'm wondering if if that has to do with the education and, and the protection of Israel based on that. Well, of course. I mean, the 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 this, this whole industry of of developing and building these museums, these Holocaust museums, or sometimes they call them museums of tolerance, is part of the indoctrination. It's part of the propaganda. It's part of the Israeli lobby. That's really what this is. It's a cynical use of the Holocaust to perpetuate uh, or to legitimize, I should say, uh, the, lie, the the Israeli crimes and perpetuate the narrative, which is that the end of the the end of the story is Israel. The end of the story of the Holocaust is Israel. And you know, number I think I think there's probably two. I would venture to say there are two reasons for that. One is that that the, the, these groups, these organizations. Um, are well-funded and they're activists. In other words, they are activists. They are out there doing the stuff. That's why they're talking and they're dealing with uh, interfering, interfering and intervening in, in, in the social studies programs and the history books and the curriculum, building museums, pushing the story forward. And, and, and I'm not surprised that such a high number of Americans know the number of 6 million Jews being killed because they do a really good job and they've been doing a really good job at, at perpetuating this narrative. Um, and, and probably the reason that you we don't see uh, slavery museums or, or museums to uh, to recognize um, other genocides like the Native Americans is because they're not white. The, the, the Jews that were killed in the Holocaust were European white people. And the slaves are black. And the Native Americans are colored pe people of color. It's not, they don't stand the same, there's not the same weight, you know. So I think it's probably the combination of both of these, both both of these things, and both of them are wrong, of course. I mean, it's it's it's, it's a reality that is, uh, you know, the way the Holocaust is used, and 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 if you want to celebrate, you know, the you know, Jewish community is thriving, you know, look at Williamsburg, look at the, you know, go up uh, to 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 Monroe County in, in in upstate New York, and you see these thriving communities of Orthodox Jews. These are exactly the communities who are survivors. Who were built by survivors of, all, of, of the Holocaust, who came directly from Auschwitz. They came to New York, there was nothing there, and today you have these thriving communities, hundreds of thousands of, of, of Jewish communities living as they did in Europe, still, still, you know, just as religious, just as, just as observant, studying the Torah, studying the Shivas, you know, and of course there are other Jewish communities that are thriving too in America and other places. But I mean, if you want, if you want to see the, the response, the proper response to the Holocaust, that would be it. Israel certainly is not, in any way, shape, or form, a response to any kind of of, uh, of racism, because it is a racist uh, project. It is a racist uh, entity. Um, so now, moving along, let's talk about what is being done and what is being done to to fight this. I mean, all three of you, of course, are involved in 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 in. Uh, 
in the remedial work that needs to be done or to fix this. Uh, so Jihan, let's go back to you. Uh, first, I list what we have been doing in the last two years. Uh, I think it's fair to mention that NAWA is a non-profit organization and non-partisan, and we have zero budget. So all our work actually uh, based 100% on, on a volunteer basis, uh, uh, and we don't have anybody to support us, so we have no string attached. Uh, and compare that actually to our knowledge of how much has been spent on some of the other side activities, uh, we feel like we are trying to achieve something with all our volunteer work. So what we did in the last two years, as I said, we are more a grassroots group and all our focus actually in the grassroots level. So we conducted first the research, de developed material, put together a list of resources to provide to teachers. And of course, we gather some textbooks reviews. We start meeting with so many uh, personnel in the education system. We started with the Board of Education. We present in front of the Board of Education about this issue and our concern. Uh, we met with the superintendent. We met with the equity program. And uh, we met with the head of the social study department in Fairfax several times and the head of the London County uh, social study program there. When we meet with them, we give them samples of the textbook review. We put in their hand a list of resources, some of them online and some of them, as Jan mentioned, name of books, uh, and, and we provide it to them. And I will go back to this resources uh, toolkit or the resources that we need to provide maybe later, because I feel like it's very important and so many teachers and actually the head of the social study department have been asking us if there is a website with those online materials as, as a resource. Uh, for us as a NOAA, this is a bigger project than us. And I think we need to collaborate with other group and uh, to, to start building something like that because it, it's very valuable than giving them a list of book or put them in a website, but it's hard copies. Uh, what we did also, we start doing, uh, first of all, I need to mention that our uh, work has been very receptive by uh, these people that we have been meeting and we build a very good relationship with them. And we have been invited, for example, to two workshops on Fairfax County Public School. Uh, where we um, represent uh, the different faces of Arabs. And uh, we talked about, of course, the elephant in the room, which is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, we hosted, uh, we called it a teacher appreciation day, but it was actually a workshop where we have a, a trivia, we have material, we have books, we have resources, we talk, and it was at the end, everybody wanna come up and share their story, even as a teacher, it was very amazing. And uh, we have like, as I said, trivia, and we weren't shy of putting one of the questions of the trivia, what is the Nakba? And there will be a discussion about it. Uh, we have been invited by La the London County in a session called uh, Humanizing Differences in the Classrooms. And we were only the first, uh, the only Arab group to be there. There was a multi group from uh, African American and multi uh, Jewish group. Uh, we present uh, our also issues there, and there was very, uh, as I said, receptive of uh, our talking point. And as a result of it, one of the teacher invited one of us to go and talk about at that topic it was about Syria. And she went to the classroom and presented about uh, Syria. Uh, we, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, the video I mentioned uh, just uh, a while ago, we actually wrote a letter uh, talking about this video and we are gonna send it to the, uh, the website that they're publishing that. 
and we might send it actually to the Fairfax County because our understanding, those videos have been adopted by the whole county. So it wasn't a teacher initiative to share these videos, but it was a county um, decision. Uh, we have been following the best of the HB 916 and SB 853 in Virginia, which the resolution asks for um, establishing a committee to be culturally relevant and inclusive education practices advisory uh, committee. And we submitted one of our, uh, the resume of one of our board member to be part in this committee. And it's, this is not in, in the county level. This is actually for the whole Virginia. And after a year of work, they should submit uh, their finding and reports and recommendation to the Senate and to the House. Uh, we get accepted, I think, as Alice to host a panel at the National Conference on Social Study, the NCSS. It was supposed to be on December, but uh, I, I don't know when it's going to happen. But we have been doing, as I said, based on voluntary work, a lot of, a lot of grassroots uh, meetings and conversation and open dialogue and showing, uh, uh, presenting materials. And just like before I'm, I'm finished, I, I wanna focus again. Um, thank you Miko for this panel and the team, but hopefully we already collaborating with Jean and Jean collaborating with Alex, whatever, but I, I, I'm looking forward more collaboration and organization because there is so much to do. There is uh, this program we started in London County and Fairfax County, and we created material, talking bones, whatever. And we would love to move, move it to other counties. So I, I think any kind of collaboration will help. And we need to look into uh, building a website with all the online resources so we can share it with the teachers, the counties, and, and so on. And we need to look into the peer-to-peer -peer program because I think this is very a nice approach or addition to our work. Uh, I will stop here, Nico and team. Thank you. Thank you, Jihan. Jihan, go ahead. Okay, um, so from ADC standpoint, I think the biggest thing right now um, you know, we, we're rebuilding a lot of our chapters nationwide and reviving a lot of the uh, chapters that we had before. And so uh, we have a very strong Southern California um, team. We got three chapters out there. And uh, we know California is also one of the states where we've seen a lot of the bullying and the, uh, the anti-Palestinian rhetoric. Um, and so our greatest asset is being able to have uh, our community members be a part of the ADC family and be able to reach out to uh, our chapters nationwide because, you know, being here in Washington, D.C. at the national level, it's very hard for us to be everywhere and see everything. And so that's one of the things that we've been focusing on and rebuilding. Another thing is uh, we've been uh, monitoring a lot of what's happening on the Hill, um, a lot of the different, uh, you know, resolutions, a lot of the bills that are coming out that are uh, favorable towards Israel, the anti-BDS laws, uh, obviously um, uh, the executive order that the president put out uh, on co for college campuses and students who advocate for Palestine on college campuses back in December <clears throat> was something uh, and is something that we continue to work on uh, along with a lot of the different Palestinian groups across the country. Um, and then, of course, um, just monitoring groups like ADL and APEC and a lot of the rhetoric that they're pushing out. Uh, it's extremely important to know that, um, you know, ADL just had an email that was leaked earlier this week uh, in regards to the annexation and, and how uh, unfavorable they've become to some civil rights groups in the U.S. And, and they're starting to realize that their footing is not as firm as it used to be when it comes to... Um, defending their actions when it comes to Israel. Uh, and so using that strategically to our advantage uh, as a Arab American based group is, uh, is also very, very helpful. And being able to communicate all of this to our community is obviously the best thing that we've been able to do. And so hosting our weekly webinars, which we've been doing uh, at ADC have also given our community a way to receive information. And so 
overall, uh, for us, it's more of a community based on the ground grassroots level. Uh, we don't work as much, obviously, with like the Board of Education. We do if we're brought into the conversation, but for us, we really want our community to understand one, what their rights are, what their kids' rights are in school, um, and then be able to assist them with uh, alternative resources, uh, speakers, uh, and also to try to minimize the uh, anti-bullying slash anti-Semitic trainings that are being held in the classroom. Wow, cool. Alex, <laughs> please go ahead. So oh, um, the, uh, the first thing I think is really important is um, to be aware of, um, as been, has been mentioned earlier, uh, any kind of teaching in the classroom that's a problematic and to raise it with um, the, the teacher and the administration, not to get the teacher in trouble or anything, but to open it for opportunities for open discussion. And uh, I think what the other side wants the least is open discussion and not closed behind closed doors, but open in the, in, out in the open because the light of day is what, what uh, the opponents are scared of. And so, uh, if one can uh, ask uh, to have an, a debate in a school, um, I would encourage people to do that um, uh, and, and, and to have discussion like that. Um, we considered when this No Place for Hate uh, program was being uh, implemented in, in my uh, son's high school, uh, I tried to, to organize, it was not successful, but try to organize a parent protest outside with signs that just would be um, counter to the messaging, like free uh, Palestines and the occupation. That's something that they don't, they would not see in any of their coursework that those are issues. And that might at least raise questions in the classroom. Because I think it's important that the students uh, understand that they're not getting the whole story. Um, I, the other thing is uh, one of their tactics is to make it painful for um, people to speak up against the mythology. And I would encourage us to make it painful for them to speak, um, to fight uh, uh, against as well. And so that is, like I mentioned, the two students who are willing to go through the hell of, of, of going to court for uh, a very small stipend for, for judging a debating contest. Um, just so you know, Texas decided that it was so embarrassing to have such a low bar that they've now increased it um, to where you have to have $100,000 for I think it's 20 employees or something so that they don't have this low a bar. Um, but uh, even uh, Abby Martin, I don't know if you all heard, uh, is, is filed suit against the state of Georgia because she had a, a one thousand dollars speaking engagement at a state school. So it's the same kind of thing. But th what that does is it brings it into the press, it brings it into open discussion, and I think that's what we need uh, because that's what makes the, the whole uh, mythology fall, crumble. Um, um, uh, I would encourage, uh, at least in Texas, and I don't know about other states, but the school, school board is an elected body. And so if you can get involved and find out which school board members in your community um, are uh, less biased, uh, I wouldn't say, I, I'm not pro-Palestinian, I'm not pro-anybody, I'm pro-equality. And so the issue is, if you can find somebody who is, um, who is, is balanced in terms of uh, valuing human rights and is not, uh, and is open to open discussion, then uh, those are the kind of people that I would uh, encourage you all to support in terms of election. And, um, and then finally, I would, I would look for uh, solidarity with other groups. Uh, we've, we've talked about uh, African-American and Native American groups mm -hmm. who also have racist issues uh, in, the, in the school, um, there's a, a famous case in Texas, I think it was in 2015, where an African-American mother was reading uh, her son's textbook and it was describing slaves as migrant workers. 
uh, workers who came to this, uh, you know, who, who, and, and uh, she raised a social uh, media storm and uh, got a lot of attention to that. And uh, I'm convinced that that affected uh, how the standards, uh, the standards in 2018. So uh, the issue is how do we bring this conversation out into the light and, uh, and, and shine a light on the, um, the contradictions and the illogical nature of, of, uh, of the arguments in the mythology. Thank you. And, uh, and, and, and join us, help us, help us out. Well, you, you mentioned, you said something about you looking for volunteers. I've got at least one that I know a, a good friend of mine that's already jumping up and down and can't wait to help you, but she's in California. So uh, maybe I can that's connect right. you. Yeah. But I think, uh, well, thank you all, all three of you. This was, this was fantastic. You guys, this is really um, dynamite stuff. And I think what Jihan said, working together and have a set, having a centralized strategy to combat this is of course, I think key. I think everybody will agree on that. And maybe that's what we need to do is to focus on how to put together some, a centralized uh, strategy. So everybody's doing what they're doing, but all working together. Um, and uh, I know we've got, I see we've got a whole bunch of questions. So uh, let's bring Jamil back in and uh, spend some time answering questions. Go ahead, Jamil. Sure. Okay. So uh, question number one is from David. Um, I went to high school in the Los Angeles area during the 60s. At that time, the book Exodus by Leon Uris was very popular and very much an influence on myself and my whole generation. It prevailed for decades as a popular and legitimate source of information about the creation of Israel. Unfortunately, it was a largely a false narrative that did a horrific amount of damage to the truth. Does anyone on the panel remember that book? And are there any comparable literary efforts going on today that are involved with the same kind of disinformation? Well, the, the, you know, that's the, uh, you have to be, I think, above a certain age to remember uh, Exodus. And then there was the movie with Paul, with, uh, with Paul Newman, which of course made it iconic, you know, it became iconic and that is what that was maybe the first or certainly the biggest influence on showing you know what 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 alex was talking about how the end of the holocaust is israel like the happy ending of the story of the horror of the holocaust is israel and exodus really exemplified that more than anything um, i'll let you guys answer this as well but i'll just say one more thing which is that i think that set a certain standard and today you could hardly see an action film an action movie where there isn't some Arab terrorist. I mean, I remember, you know, I went to see Black Panther, which everybody thought was gonna be a great movie and, you know, very black and very kind of, you know, and the first, one of the first scenes is, is, is uh, the terrorists are wearing kafiyas and speaking Arabic. And when, are they out of their freaking minds? I mean, what, why do they need this? But it's almost like you have to have that connection the, because this is part of, part of a narrative that has to be inserted into anything, every, every, anything and everything. And that really continues that. But guys, go ahead and, 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 and uh, let's see what you, what you all think about this. It's a good point. And it, I'll just say that somebody has mentioned Exodus to me is how they learned about Israel. And yeah. so when we started to have conversations, um, the thing that I would encourage people to do is is whenever you see these um, these these kind of stereotypes, just ask, just ask. Um, you know, I, I like to play Mad Libs where you just change the people and say, okay, now say that again, but put in African Americans or put in Jews or put in something else, and then just say it out loud and tell me how you react. And suddenly they realize, wow, that is so racist. <laughs> so anyway, it's just a an, an idea. Just try that. Yeah. Well, there's there's the re real Arabs too. That was um, Janan. You know, you're familiar with real Arabs. Uh, yeah. It's a documentary. It shows a documentary, and I think there's a book too that shows how mm -hmm. Arabs have been portrayed by Hollywood over the last several decades. And you know, again, that is the same. It's 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 exact same narrative. It's the exact same arc as as. Uh, um, 
exodus showing these good Jews, these white civilized people who suffered and are now fighting for their liberation. And basically these, 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 you know, primitive people who are trying to kill them sort of thing. I mean, that's really, that's really the, the narrative that's being uh, displayed. And, and that's what he, that's what is talked about in real Arabs, real, real spelled R-E-E-L. The one, the one, uh, one that comes to mind where the Arabs are portrayed, I think, positively, is Lawrence of Arabia. And that would be the exception, I think. Yeah. Ready for a question two? Sure. Okay. So this one is anonymous. Um, how quickly do bad faith, disingenuous accusations of anti-Semitism? come up in the context of educators presenting a factual historical view of the Israel-Palestine conflict? Anybody go ahead and jump in. Can you repeat uh, the question? Sure. So how quickly do bad faith, disingenuous accusations of anti-Semitism come up in the context of educators presenting a factual historical view of the Israel-Palestine conflict? I would encourage you all to uh, go to our website and there's video of the testimony that was done in front of the State Board of Education. And it's very interesting. We include uh, in the video both the uh, both sides of the testimony, the, our side as well as the opponent's side. And it's very interesting how they bring up uh, the, 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 the narratives of anti-Semitism and the protection and so on and so forth. And even, and you can tell there's one uh, board member who is extremely Zionist. And he asked, even though there was a Palestinian person who testi to provide testimony in there, he asks the Jewish Federation representative to answer the question of what the Palestinians are thinking. <laughs> I mean, it's just really interesting. So I, I encourage you, there's a video and I'll put it in the chat, the, uh, the URL for you all. Anyone else on that one? Go ahead. Okay, this is a great question. Uh, what would be some good books to recommend for purchase for my school librarian? So there's, this was touched on a little earlier and I, cause I can anticipate this question, I'm, I'm gonna jump in here and shout out this book, Badawi by Leila Abdul Razak. And this is like a, gra a short graphic novel and it would be engaging to a nine-year-old and it was engaging to someone in their mid-30s to read it. It's about uh, basically the life of Palestinian refugee <laughs> and a lot of interpersonal and, and family uh, hardships that go along with it. So that'd be my rec. Well, yeah, that, that I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mentioned the two earlier. Um, Mornings in Janine uh, by Susan Abul Hawa, and then uh, Curious Land by uh, Suzanne Daraj. Uh, Suzanne also has another, uh, Suzanne Daraj also has another book. I'm trying to remember the name of it, um, which was also really good. But the reason why I like uh, both of those is just because you're learning about Palestine and its history while actually reading a fiction story, so to speak. Um, and so it's a little easier to absorb uh, a lot of the information versus like reading something that's a little bit more, you know, black and white, because there's a lot of great books out there that are also uh, about Palestine. I mean, I would say maybe high school, you could do Nura Ayrakat's book, uh, Justice for Some. But it is a pretty heavy book, so I would say like probably not any younger than maybe 11th or 12th grade. Uh, but if you're looking for something that's going to be an easy read, those would be the two that I would um, recommend. And then Amir Zahar, the comedian, also has a really good book, Being Palestinian Makes Me Smile. So it's a short book, but it's just like a really nice, easy read that would also be good, I think, to, to have in a school library. Yeah, I just want to uh, say that we actually at now we bought a list of books, recommended books from elementary, middle and high school. And just feel free because it's a long list if you and videos as well. So send us an email at general at nawa.org and we can share this list with you. But uh, I, I want to take the time here and to highlight uh, 
how small books like B for Palestine, I'm sure you all heard about it, or under the olive tree, they make a big conflict and resistance from uh, the Israeli lobby. And it was supposed to be part of a library in New Jersey. And I forget the detail of the story. So they forbid this book to be actually in a, in a library. But the list of books is available and is another ba battle actually is how to convince or to push these books to be part of the educational system as, as resources. I would add, um, if we're talking about history, history as like a history book, um, Noor Masalha, the Palestinian historian from the University of London published um, Palestine and a 4,000 year history. And it's probably the only book that actually deals with the history of Palestine without getting mixed up with the biblical narrative. He's just basing it on history. Um, and so I think it's a great, so it's a great resource. And if we're talking about fiction, I would also add uh, Ibrahim Nasrallah, uh, The Time of White Horses. It's a thick book, it's a saga, but it starts in the Ottoman times and ends in 1948. And it's a story of a single village uh, and it's all based, the whole story is based on stories that he has picked up from older, you know, refugees. And uh, he created this incredible, incredible saga. It's really hard to put down. It's very thick, but I would definitely add that as a, as a, as a great resource, as a great book. So there's, and there's tons. I mean, there's so many lists and so many great things. Mm -hmm. I think from Badawi, which I agree is excellent, to Suzy Abulhawa, to everything else. Um, and, uh, and to recommend it to the teachers, just bring them, to, bring them a copy and say, hey, look at this, this is my copy, take a look at it, use it. And, and I think mostly teachers are happy to get these resources, to receive these resources. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Time for one or two more. more. Yeah, yeah. Um, we did have um, a few people asking about a link to that 60 Minutes program you mentioned, Miko. So um, we're going to assemble all of the, as many links and resources as possible from this. Just give us a couple of days and then you'll get an email if you attended this um, with, with a list of those resources. But um, also if you want to dig through the chat, a lot of people have been reposting stuff. Um, here's a question from uh, Razan. One of the panelists, I think it was Alex, mentioned resources for teaching the history of Christianity in Palestine. Could you please share those resources? Did you mention that? I don't remember. I, don't remember. I, I did not mention that. No. Maybe they got their panelists mixed up. There is. Um, it, it could. It could yeah. be the the uh, the uh, when I showed um, the truth in textbooks uh, feedback, they were they were commenting on that. I don't know if that's it, if somebody else was. Or if There's there. Kingdom of Heaven, I think it's called. There's a movie that was made based on that as well. And it's a really good book. It's an excellent, excellent book. It clashed between King Richard and uh, Salahuddin, but it gives a lot of background as to the Christian history. And you know, the Christian history, there's two parts of the Christian history in Palestine. There's the Christian history that came with the Crusades. And then there's the more indigenous Christians that came down from Lebanon and Syria and settled in Palestine. Um, Jeanette, you might know more about that being a Palestinian Christian, but uh, it's a it's a very very interesting. The Christian communities in Palestine have shrunk tremendously from I think something like twelve percent to less than two percent of the population. Uh, but the Christian uh, uh, monuments and the Christian uh, uh, like sanctuaries, all these beautiful Christian all all throughout Palestine in the Galilee, everywhere in Jerusalem, certainly in Yaffa, everywhere. Uh, anything you want to add on that, uh, 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 Jihan? Uh, I'm not sure what can I add. I can add, add a lot in this topic. Being a Christian Palestinian, and we have a rich history of, of that area. And um, I don't know, when I talk about the, the, this topic in specific, I get so emotional. Uh, because as all of you know, like we, we are trying like in, in, in the whole thing, we are as not exist. We are Palestinian, they just associated with Muslims. 
I have been working with my colleagues for 20 years and they know I celebrate Christmas and Easter. And after 10 years or 20 years, they said, oh, are you Muslim? No offensive or whatever, but why it cannot get into your head? I'm a Palestinian, but at the same time, I'm a Christian. And uh, this is sad. This is sad. Well, it's ignorance. Yep. Yeah. You want to do one more or close it out? Let's go do it one more and then we'll be done. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Ian has a question. Are there any books publishing the U.S. evidence that's being presented here similar to Nurit Peled El Elhanan's, Elhanan's classic analysis of Israeli school books? Is there like a... Yes. Yeah. That's my sister's book. I think yeah, we talked I'm about... I'm looking at you for this one. Well, the, the, I think what Gene suggested and what we're looking at doing is having a part three to this in which we will have uh, uh, my sister talk about her book, which is basically, I mean, it was, it, was, it, was a, it, was, it was a trailblazer because she dared to show as an academic through scientific uh, research that the Israeli education system and the Israeli textbooks in high schools are racist, inherently racist, and systemically racist. And uh, Jean suggested that we put her together with a, uh, an African-American professor who has done the same thing regarding uh, black history here in America and the textbooks. And so we're putting that, we're talking about doing that um, and we'll let everybody know once that's done. So I think that kind of answers the question, right? The question was, if there are any parallels, is that what the question was? Yeah, is, uh, there a, is there a US version of it? So I think, well, I think the US version would be how the Native American story is told and how the African American story is told. And on both of these issues, I think there's a lot to be desired. Um, so that's what we're looking at right now. And of course, we'll let everybody know as soon as we, uh, uh, as soon as that's finalized, what we're, we're talking about and working on that right now. So that'll be kind of the part three of this. Because, you know, settler colonial societies don't like to admit and tell the story of what really happened uh, to the native people as they, or not to mention slaves, um, as they built their, you know, their countries. So, okay, I think it's time. So thank you all very, very much, all three of you, Jihan, Jinan, and uh, Alex, for your time, for your valuable input, for the great work that you're doing. Thank you to all the participants and people asking questions and making comments. Jamil, thank you. And Michael, thank you behind the scenes. Um, and uh, let's all stay in touch. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. so much. Bye-bye.